The FBI guns down a notorious gangster, but this death mask suggests that they may have shot the wrong man. No one thought it was him. A twisted scrap of metal pulled from a blazing inferno leads investigators to an astonishing discovery. It's shocking that this was a military plane. Onlookers instantly thought the city was under attack. A mighty freighter vanishes suddenly, leaving investigators with a mystifying puzzle. It shouldn't have gone down, but it did. Nobody to this day knows why. Across the United States, in the nation's most revered institutions, our celebrated history is on display. Wondrous treasures from the past, bizarre relics. But behind every amazing artifact is another tale to be told and a secret waiting to be revealed. These are the Mysteries at the Museum. New York, America's most populated city, is often at the center of the nation's news. And no story has been bigger than the attacks of September 11, 2001. But that wasn't the first time that an airplane flew into a skyscraper here, at the Museum of the City of New York. Is an artifact that tells of a largely forgotten incident that brought dread and destruction to this famous city. Chief Curator Sarah Henry is one of the few people who have closely studied this object. You can see that it's damaged, and it's clearly a remnant of some kind of piece of machinery. This twisted 20-pound hunk of metal is in fact part of an old airplane engine, and its ruined condition suggests it was in a violent crash. Painted on it is a telltale sign, which says July 28th. 1945. The date marks the day that this engine part and the rest of the plane it belonged to were found in the most improbable of places and in the most shocking of circumstances. What happened on that fateful summer day in New York City? July 1945. Almost four years after the attack on Pearl Harbor, America is still at war with Japan. And the fear of another strike is never far away. Throughout the war, there was always fear that there could be attack on the U.S. mainland. On the morning of July 28th, as the city is shrouded in fog, a telltale noise seems to confirm New Yorkers' worst fears. Shortly before 10 o'clock, witnesses reported hearing a plane flying very low over the streets of Manhattan. Helpless New Yorkers stare up at the sky in awe as an ominous shadow crosses the midtown streets. Out of the overcast sky, a plane dropped into view, and it was literally weaving its way through the canyons of Manhattan. The plane is flying barely 1,000 feet above ground, only narrowly missing buildings. People were just completely terrified. A lot of people ran. Suddenly, the plane banks left. The onlookers cannot believe their eyes. They could literally see it heading for the side of the tallest building in New York City, the Empire State Building. There were accounts of people who, who stopped their cars, and they're sort of shouting at it to climb to avoid the building, but that's not what happened. At exactly 9.49 a.m., an earth-shattering boom shakes the city. The onlookers instantly thought the city was under attack. They thought, oh no, this is it. This is what happened at Pearl Harbor. Here they come. The impact of the plane combined with the gasoline inside this very engine, creates a powerful explosion. The blast rips an 18 by 20 foot hole, spewing fire and black smoke from the 78th and 79th floors of the Empire State Building. Within minutes, emergency crews are racing to the burning building. In under an hour, the blaze is extinguished. Because the emergency services were so well primed in wartime, the first responders were incredible. They were able to contain the fire very, very quickly. But sifting through the wreckage, the rescue crews make a shocking discovery. The plane is not an enemy bomber. This engine part helps identify the aircraft as belonging to the US Army. It was a B-25 bomber. It's terrifying and shocking that this was a military plane. 
The authorities immediately launch an investigation to find out how a U.S. military plane could crash into New York's tallest building. While investigators learn that the bomber was on a routine flight to Newark, New Jersey, the actual cause of the accident is a mystery. There was a lot of debate at the time. There were three major possibilities. One was that it was pilot error. One was that there was some kind of mechanical problem. And one was that it was mishandled by air traffic control. So it remained unsettled, and it still remains a mystery today, exactly what the sequence of events were. Although over 1,000 people were safely evacuated that fateful morning, the disaster claims 14 lives. 11 people in the building, along with the three who were on the plane, were killed that day. But despite the impact of a 10-ton bomber and the subsequent fire, which ravages two floors, the Empire State Building stands strong. It was clearly a very solidly built building, but also, if you're going to contrast it, say, with what happened to 9-11, it was a small plane. In the aftermath of the disaster, the resilience of New Yorkers is reaffirmed, and the Empire State Building is quickly repaired. The Empire State Building, in a lot of ways, is the symbol of New York City. That very distinctive spire, you can't mistake it with any other place. Over 200 miles away, in the nation's capital, lies a plastered death mask, cast from the corpse of one of America's most wanted gangsters. But is it really his face? Or does the mask prove he got away? Find out next on Mysteries at the Museum. Washington, D.C. The nation's capital is home to the biggest names in law enforcement, like the world-famous FBI. So it is a fitting location for the National Museum of Crime and Punishment. We don't just show the romantic side of American history, we show it all. The good, the bad, and the ugly. This 25,000 square foot facility houses intriguing artifacts that once belonged to infamous lawbreakers like Jesse James, Bonnie and Clyde, and Al Capone. But among this cache of criminality is one particularly chilling artifact. It's a plaster mold of a man's face made with impressive precision. Each individual eyebrow is able to be seen. It's called a death mask and it was cast directly from the corpse of a notorious bank robber. Death masks were used as a way to identify criminals upon their passing. According to the FBI, this death mask is proof that they gunned down a man once known as public enemy number one, John Dillinger. But to the people that knew the elusive outlaw, the resemblance between the death mask and the man is no dead certainty, leaving some experts to wonder, is this really John Dillinger's death mask? Or did the FBI gun down the wrong man? July 1933, the Great Depression grips the United States. Over 20% of the nation is unemployed. Many citizens blame the banks for the crisis and see the famous bank robber John Dillinger as an outlaw hero. John Dillinger was the man doing what so many American citizens wanted to do. They wanted to get back at the banks, the banks they felt that they had been wronged by. From 1933 to 1934, Dillinger and his gang knock over 11 banks, grabbing around $300,000. And in that period, Dillinger breaks out of jail twice. It is these exploits that send his popularity skyrocketing. John Dillinger became more of a mythical figure than an actual man. But by 1934, a new crime-fighting task force is tracking Dillinger's every move, the FBI. Its leader, J. Edgar Hoover, is determined to establish his reputation by hunting down the nation's most notorious criminal. The Bureau of Investigation was still cutting its chops, trying to make a name for itself in American society, claiming a place in law enforcement. But the Bureau can only prosecute federal crimes, so it is powerless to go after Dillinger on state charges. The FBI watches as the outlaw slips by local authorities in Illinois, Indiana, and Ohio. Finally, in the spring of 1934, Dillinger breaks a federal law by driving a stolen police car across state lines. The FBI seizes its chance. The feds track Dillinger to Chicago, where he's lying low with a woman named Anna Sage. Anna Sage was an immigrant from Romania. She had turned to prostitution and opening a house of ill repute to make ends meet. Unbeknownst to Dillinger, 
his confidant is about to betray him. She was facing deportation, so in an effort to try and save her own skin, she gave up her friend. On July 22nd, Anna Sage tips off the FBI that she and Dillinger will be at Chicago's Biograph Theater later that night. And in case the feds have trouble spotting Dillinger in the crowd, Anna tells them that she'll be wearing an orange skirt and white blouse. As the movie rolls, a posse of armed agents surround the theater. There were maybe 20 to 30 agents, sole purpose to hone in on John Dillinger. When the film ends, Dillinger and his companion leave the theater. Five shots ring out in the crowd. Hoover gets the news by telephone. 31-year-old John Dillinger is dead outside of the Biograph Theater. But almost immediately, images of the corpse launch rumors that it wasn't Dillinger who died that night. And the death mask made for the FBI from the dead man's face lacked some of Dillinger's signature facial characteristics. The mask is missing a prominent dimple in the chin and a mole above the eye. Coroner's photographs run in the papers and some of Dillinger's adoring public become suspicious. When they saw a photo of the corpse, a bloated body with no dimple, no mole, none of the charisma that the man had possessed in life, no one thought it was him. Did Anna Sage double cross the feds and bring a stooge to the movies that night? The discrepancies between the death mask and the man himself suggest that perhaps the FBI had shot the wrong man. But in a follow-up investigation, one of Dillinger's comrades reveals the shocking answer to federal agents. In May 1934, just eight weeks before he died, Dillinger underwent a very primitive form of plastic surgery. The surgeon removed his identifying mole and filled in his signature dimple. For J. Edgar Hoover, this information is proof that the death mask is real and that he did get his man. And for over 20 years, a copy of Dillinger's death mask hangs outside his office door as a trophy. At the end of the day, J. Edgar Hoover, I'm convinced, did get public enemy number one. Dillinger's death cements the nascent FBI's reputation. Through the capture of the high-profile gangster, the Federal Bureau of Investigation takes its place as the nation's premier crime-fighting force. Across the nation in Reno, Nevada, there's a beat-up century-old car that once traveled where no automobile had gone before. How did this 1907 Thomas Flyer change the way we live forever? Find out next on Mysteries at the Museum. Reno, Nevada, a small city known for its bright lights. Here, the National Automobile Museum pays tribute to what may be the most important machine of the 20th century. The vehicles here range from classic models to race cars and rare showpieces. Each elaborate design is evidence of the world's love affair with the car. But one vehicle stands apart, the car that sparked this obsession with all things automotive. We have several special pieces, I think, in this collection, but uh, probably one truly outstanding automobile. It wasn't Ford's Model T, and it wasn't a European luxury car. The old-fashioned seats are perched high behind the steering wheel. And there's no roof, no windows, and no windshield. Our particular automobile is a 1907 Model 35 Thomas Flyer. This four-cylinder, 60-horsepower car traversed the globe in one of the most grueling car races ever conceived. In the process, this singular car shattered the way the world looked at automobiles. It's a groundbreaking piece that opened vistas and frontiers to, uh, well, to people all over the world. So how did this 1907 Thomas Flyer transform the way we think about the automobile forever? New York City, 1908. The newly invented automobile is still viewed with skepticism and curiosity. In the early 20th century, the automobile was an oddity outside of the big cities in America and Europe. In rural areas, cars are virtually unknown. But a spectacular competition is about to change everything. The race was originally the idea of two newspapers. The New York Times and Le Matin in Paris come up with a scheme to drive up circulation. They'll sponsor and report on a nearly inconceivable 22,000-mile round-the-world race from New York City to Paris, France. From New York City, the cars would drive across the United States. They would travel by freighter up to Alaska and then drive over pack ice to Russia. 
then across Siberia through Eastern Europe to finally reach the finish line in Paris. There are no roads, no maps, and no service stations. I'm sure that many people felt this was absolute madness. Uh, you know, that there was absolutely no way these fragile machines uh, could make it across country, let alone around the world. The mind-boggling contest is dubbed the race of the century. February 12, 1908. A quarter of a million people pile into Times Square to catch a glimpse of the race cars and their heroic drivers. There were six official entrants in the race, three of these from France, one from Germany, one from Italy, and one from the United States. America's hopes are pinned on a car made in Buffalo by the E.R. Thomas Motor Company, named the Thomas Flyer. The Flyer would be piloted by various drivers, but the key member of the team is the mechanic named George Schuster. It's his job to keep the car running all around the world. When the starting pistol fires, the cars take off up Broadway at top speed, 30 miles an hour. Of course, shortly after they left New York City proper, they ran into the elements. Harsh conditions lay ahead for the racers. All of these automobiles, including the Thomas, were open cars. No roof, no windows, no power steering, no power brakes. With no highways, the cars take advantage of another transport innovation, railroads. But when the wooden ties rip up the Thomas Flyer's tires, Schuster wraps the wheels in rope. At each camp, the mechanic works into the night to keep the car running. 41 days after leaving New York, the race reaches San Francisco, and only three teams are still in it. The Thomas Flyer, the German Protos, and the Italian Zust. The Thomas is in the lead, uh, reaching San Francisco. But the most daunting and dangerous stretch lies ahead. The Flyer is the first car shipped to Alaska to attempt the perilous drive over the frozen Bering Strait. These people had never seen pack ice and had no idea what they were coming up against. And it was physically impossible for an automobile of any type to get across to that sort of ice. The race organizers hastily redraw the course. By the time the cars are shipped to Siberia, only two contestants remain, the Germans and the Thomas Flyer. As they race across Eastern Europe, the two rival teams are neck and neck. But on the outskirts of Paris, mechanic George Schuster and the Thomas Flyer face an obstacle that threatens to put them out of the race. Schuster finally crosses into France. He arrives at the gates of Paris, and a gendarme steps out in front of him and says, no pass. He says, you cannot enter Paris without functioning headlights. One of the headlights had been knocked out along the way and had never been fixed. A passerby on a bicycle offers his headlight. But no one has tools on hand to attach the new fixture. They finally take the entire bicycle and throw it up on the hood of the Thomas and strap it down. Now he has two functioning headlights and he can enter Paris. In Paris, Schuster is devastated to find the Germans have beaten him to the line. But the judges step in. The Germans, it is revealed, had cheated by taking two shortcuts. So 30 days are added to their finishing time. The Thomas Flyer and George Schuster are pronounced winners of the world's first round-the-world automobile race. The 1908 New York to Paris race proved to be more than just an epic adventure. It proved to the world that the automobile was the future of transportation. And while Henry Ford's Model T did put the world on wheels, it was the Thomas Flyer that proved that those wheels can go anywhere in the world. Seventy years later, another marvel of engineering makes a treacherous crossing. When this huge ship suddenly disappears, it leaves a baffling puzzle. Why did a Great Lakes freighter vanish without so much as a single distress call? Next, on Mysteries at the Museum. Lake Superior, the largest freshwater lake in the world and one of the busiest shipping routes in the United States. But this giant body of water is also a treacherous inland sea. Lake Superior is probably the most dangerous of all five Great Lakes because of its immense size. Superior's famed tempests have destroyed hundreds of vessels. And in Paradise, Michigan, artifacts from many of those lost ships are on display at the Great Lakes Shipwreck Museum. Here, a haunting artifact strikes a melancholy chord in all who view it. It's a recovered relic from one of the most famous and puzzling shipwrecks in U.S. history. The light dances off it. It's been polished. It's glittering. And then you see the name carved into it. It's a 200-pound bronze bell that once sat on the deck of the SS Edmund Fitzgerald. The Fitzgerald was launched in 1958. And for the next 17 years, she was one of the most celebrated freighters on the Great Lakes. 
The Fitzgerald was the largest and the fastest, carried the most cargo, very reliable. But on the 10th of November, 1975, the mighty ship disappeared without warning. What exactly happened on the Edmund Fitzgerald's tragic final journey? November 9th, 1975, Superior, Wisconsin. The Edmund Fitzgerald takes on a cargo of over 26,000 tons of iron ore bound for a steel mill near Detroit. Her route would take her 350 miles across the lake before heading south to her destination. At her helm is an experienced skipper, Captain Ernest McSorley. The Fitzgerald is not alone on the lake. An hour after she departs, another Great Lakes freighter, the Arthur M. Anderson, also embarks on a similar course. As they set out, both ships pick up an ominous weather warning. There were storm warnings out there, but this wasn't severe enough to deter the Fitzgerald. But by the following day, a ferocious storm is battering both ships. In the midst of the tempest, the Anderson receives a radio call from Captain McSorley. The Fitzgerald has just lost both of her radars, and he needs help navigating. They were sailing blind. All they had was a compass and a prayer. But McSorley assures the Anderson that despite the radar problems, the Fitzgerald is holding up. This is the last anyone ever hears from the Edmund Fitzgerald. Within moments, that ship disappeared off the radar. It was just like it disappeared off the planet. At 8.25 p.m., the Anderson radios the Coast Guard with an emergency message. The Edmund Fitzgerald has vanished. What has happened to one of the biggest freighters on the lake? Within a few hours, a fleet of Coast Guard boats and planes are speeding toward the last known location of the great ship. And all they found was a half of a lifeboat, very little debris, but enough to let them know that uh, nobody successfully got off the ship. There's no question the Fitzgerald was gone. What caused the ship to flounder so suddenly is a mystery, and it will be six months before any trace of the ship is found. May of 1976, the Navy launches an underwater vehicle that they hope will locate the ship and reveal why she sank. They're moving closer and closer to it, and all of a sudden this big mountain of steel appears in front of them. The words on the ship's stern confirm, it's the Fitzgerald. It was a big moment, yeah. There's 29 guys entombed forever down there. There's mixed emotions. The Edmund Fitzgerald is split in two. The bow section lies 170 feet away from the stern. The wreckage indicates the massive ship sank so fast that it broke apart as it struck the bed of Lake Superior. Why did this 729 foot ship sink? It shouldn't have sunk. The storm was bad, but not that bad. And today this mystery lingers because all the experts can't agree on why the ship went down. Several theories emerge that attempt to explain why the ship went down so quickly. The Coast Guard reports suggest the Fitzgerald took on water throughout the trip through leaky hatch covers and that it was this that caused her to sink. Others think the ship was hit by a set of powerful rogue waves. But there is a third suggestion. But the most popular theory that most sailing captains on the Great Lakes kind of lean towards is the shoaling theory. The captain of the Anderson believes he spotted the Fitzgerald dangerously close to a shallow rocky area called Caribou Shoal. It's possible the Edmund Fitzgerald ran aground and ripped a hole in the hull. But while the theories are intriguing, none of them gives a definitive answer. It shouldn't have gone down, but it did. Nobody to this day knows why. In 1995, the Great Lakes Shipwreck Museum makes another dive to Superior's floor this time to retrieve one last vestige of the ship. We managed to recover the bell from dark silence 535 feet below. The bell at the Great Lakes Shipwreck Museum remains a somber reminder of the greatest enigma in Great Lakes history. The Edmund Fitzgerald has become the most recognized and most mysterious of the losses on the Great Lakes. It's North America's shipwreck. Over 1,000 miles away in New Haven, Connecticut, the grand library of an Ivy League university holds a surprisingly modest artifact. This simple metal dish inspired what may be the most popular toy of all time, and the world has never been quite the same since. Coming up on Mysteries at the Museum. New Haven, Connecticut. Since 1701, home to Yale University. 
For over 300 years, this college has been educating America's finest minds, including five U.S. presidents. Yale's main library, the Sterling Memorial Library, boasts a collection that makes it a world-class museum. Aside from millions of manuscripts, the Sterling's archives also hold thousands of unusual historical relics. The Yale objects are a collection also unto themselves. We have about 1,500 Yale-related objects. The collection consists mainly of artifacts related to scholarly pursuits, but it also includes an unexpected piece of pure, fantastical fun. This simple metal pie plate inspired one of the most well-loved toys of all time, the Frisbee. Probably everyone somewhere in their closet has at least one Frisbee, but no one really has any idea of where Frisbee came from. How did a pie maker, a UFO fanatic, and a group of students all come together to help create one of the world's most popular toys? This unusual story begins in Bridgeport, Connecticut in 1871. A local pie maker opens up shop. His name is William Frisbee. Over subsequent decades, his company grows, and each year Frisbee delivers thousands of pies to buyers all over New England. Each pie pan is stamped with a built-in advertisement. The bottom of the metal plate is embossed with the name of the company, Frisbee's Pies. Eventually, enterprising kids all over the region begin to notice something. To their delight, the empty Frisbee pie pans turn out to be wonderfully aerodynamic. It was a pretty inexpensive toy for five cents. The pie plate flinging game also spreads to New England colleges, including Yale. Frisbee. There's just one problem. These could be somewhat lethal, throwing these heavy metal pans, and they would shout Frisbee as they were tossing them off into a crowd. And so this was like shouting four at a golf game. Watch out, a Frisbee's coming. Playing catch with Frisbee's pie tins remains a local fad through the early 20th century. It would take many more years and the innovations of a new generation before the world-famous toy takes flight. Frisbee. 1948, California. An inventor named Fred Morrison, who was a kid tossed around the lids of paint cans and popcorn tins, has been trying to create a better flying disc. Fred Morrison knew about plastics and was looking for something to earn him a living after being in the service. Morrison designs a rigid plastic disc that soars through the air. To market the new toy, Morrison tries to cash in on America's obsession with UFOs, and he dubs his new flying disc the Pluto Platter. The idea of having a toy that was in the shape of a flying saucer was something they thought would really appeal. But Morrison is stuck hawking Pluto platters on his own until he meets up with a toy legend named Richard Nur. It was such a good toy that it caught the attention of Richard Nur, who was the head of the Whammo toy company. Nur, whose company Whammo popularized such powerhouse toys as the hula hoop, the slip and slide, and the Super Bowl, thinks he has spotted another winner. So in 1957, Whammo purchases the rights to Morrison's Pluto platter. What are they? Spaceships from Mars? No, they're Whammo flying saucer. It really took the entrepreneur Richard Nur and his already established Whammo factory to mass produce these items. But even Nur and Whammo struggle to get sales of the Pluto platter off the ground. Nur stumbles upon the answer during a marketing trip to Northeast colleges. While handing out promotional copies of his Pluto platter at Yale, Nur is surprised to hear students yell a strange word after throwing the discs. Frisbee! Frisbee. It's the word that's been used since the first pie tins were tossed across this campus half Frisbee. a century ago. To Nur, it just sounds like a catchy new name. Frisbee. He decided that maybe his toy would sell better if he gave it a better name. In 1958, Whammo redistributes the Pluto platter as the Frisbee, though with a different spelling to avoid conflict with the pie company. And soon the toy becomes a smash hit. Pick your game, pick your Frisbee, and pick up on the fun. Since its release, well over 300 million Frisbees have been made. It's even thought that up to 90% of all Americans have at some point in their lives played with a Frisbee. But the Frisbee is more than just a beloved toy. It's the story of how great collaborations are made. Over 800 miles away in Grand Rapids, Michigan, the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Museum also houses a surprising piece of history. For thousands of people, what was once just a metal staircase became the difference between salvation and doom. Coming up next on Mysteries at the Museum.
in Grand Rapids, Michigan. The Gerald R. Ford Museum commemorates our nation's 38th president. Inside some 18,000 artifacts celebrate Ford's contributions as a statesman from his decades in Congress through his years in the Oval Office. But there's one artifact here that haunted President Ford until the day he died. Made of steel, it is 32 inches wide and rises 15 feet high. This simple metal staircase symbolizes one of the most controversial and tragic moments in U.S. history, the fall of Saigon. The staircase represents today, uh, depending upon your point of view, defeat or freedom. In April of 1975, after a decade of bloody fighting, the U.S. war in Vietnam ends on this narrow staircase. How did this staircase become a lifeline to thousands and close the door on one of America's longest and most bitter conflicts? January 1973. The unpopular Vietnam War draws to a close when the Paris Peace Accords are signed. For nearly a decade, the United States has supported the South Vietnamese in a civil war against the Communist North. But over the next three months, the United States sends home nearly all of its 156,000 combat troops. But the U.S. withdrawal leaves South Vietnam exposed to the rampaging armies of the North. Many in the U.S. government feel confident that South Vietnam will be able to repel any major assaults for a few years at least. But North Vietnam's communist army attacks with brutal force. They saw um, America's um, measured withdrawal as a sign of weakness and one that they could exploit, and they did so rather quickly. In rapid succession, the North Vietnamese Army seized the major South Vietnamese cities of Hue and Da Nang. By the time you get to March of 1975, some 13, 14 provinces in uh, South Vietnam had fallen to the North Vietnamese forces. By the end of March 1975, the situation is looking dire for American diplomats and the last remaining ground forces in the country. For tens of thousands of South Vietnamese who have been supporting the Americans, things are even worse. If the North's army reaches Saigon, they will be looked upon as collaborators and their lives will be in mortal peril. Each day, the 100,000 strong North Vietnamese army pushes closer to the South Vietnamese capital. The fall of Saigon is now just days away. Flights were going in and out of Saigon's airport around the clock. Vietnamese were feeling uh, intense pressure, panicked pressure to get out of the city. On the morning of April 29th, the airlift comes to an abrupt end. North Vietnamese forces arrive at dawn, bomb the airport, and destroy the runway. Roughly 1,400 Americans and thousands more South Vietnamese are surrounded and trapped in Saigon. For the Americans and any Vietnamese with the right papers, the only way in or out of the city is by helicopter. One of the most prominent evacuation points is the U.S. Embassy. The crush of people is just overwhelming. There's pushing and shoving, there's people climbing over the gates. For the rest of the day and night, several thousand make it to the roof of the embassy. Once on the rooftop, they encounter this staircase, seen here with hordes of people desperate to climb its metal steps to safety. The emotions must have been overwhelming because when you're looking up that ladder, it's life and death matter. Over 200 choppers fly that day spiriting thousands of people to safety. And then finally, the last evacuees are situated on the rooftop, protected by um, the Marine guards. At 7.53 a.m., the last 11 U.S. Marines board the final helicopter and leave Vietnam. Hundreds of South Vietnamese allies are stranded at the embassy. Thousands more clamor through the streets of Saigon. Just three hours later, at 11 a.m., North Vietnamese tanks crash through the gates of the presidential palace. One hour later, the U.S. Embassy falls. Communist officials send over 200,000 South Vietnamese to so-called re-education camps, where many die. Ford was haunted uh, throughout his years for those he was unable to get out. 
It was, he described, his darkest day in office. On July 2nd, 1976, North and South Vietnam are officially united as a single communist state. The lessons of Vietnam are still being learned, um, and they will continue to be learned for generations to come. The long and decisive war truly ends when the last U.S. Marine climbs these steps. And while many were left in the streets of Saigon, thousands of evacuees did make it to the helicopters. Ford was very proud of those he was able to get out and relocate. The metal staircase at the Gerald Ford Museum symbolizes the bitter end of an unpopular war. But it also represents the beginning of a new life for the South Vietnamese who climbed these steps to freedom. Staircases and spinning discs. Outliers and outlaws. Recovered wreckage and lost ships. These are the mysteries at the museum.